So, hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Matias Cafaro. I am a professor at the University of Puerto Rico, and my specialty is trichomycetes. Okay, as you know, because you guys work with the same group. And uh, we are here basically to do a little bit of history about ourselves and how we interacted with our late advisor, Bob Lickberg, who uh, we knew pretty well. So I'll start with you, Merlin. Yeah, so uh, Merlin White and a uh, professor at Boise State University. I spent a lot of time as a student with Bob, met Matthias there uh, as graduate students, two of the last graduate students, the two last graduate students he had yes. essentially in the lab and in the University of Kansas. I have great memories of Bob, um, both as a professional and a, and a person uh, from those experiences. And um, it's really a treasure to think about sharing some of this here at the MSA meeting, a meeting that he so loved to, to attend and come and anticipate. And, uh, and he's been on my mind a lot, especially for that reason, but uh, losing him relatively recently. So it's great to have a chance to share some of these thoughts and, and uh, ideas and, and kind of uh, mentorship that he gave us as a, as a way to kind of recall his, that legacy of time and energy and passion, not only for the fungi, but the people that he shared it he with. Shared yeah. it. Yeah. And then, well, we're going to share a little bit of memories, and you guys are the new crop of <laughs> the trichomycin <laughs> world. So why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? So we start with you, Nicole. And the microphone's over there. Yeah, Nicole Reynolds. <laughs> and yeah. Wong. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm Nicole, and I was uh, Merlin's master's student. And actually, it was because of Merlin that I got interested in trichomycetes. I was an undergrad, and I took the mycology class. And Merlin was so enthusiastic talking about these things, trichomycetes I'd never heard of before. And I just thought it was so amazing that there's these strange little fungi inside these insects. And so I actually asked him if I could volunteer in the lab and, and do some work. And so I actually spent a year volunteering before I started the master's program. And I was able to learn so much about trichomycetes during that time. And it was really a great opportunity. And I also, of course, read many of Dr. Lickbart's papers. And, and it was a great opportunity. And I really enjoyed studying things that so, so few people really know about. And I think there's a lot, so much more to discover. It makes it really exciting to be in the field. So. Yeah. It reminds me of a, Bob was full of slogans. And one of the <laughs> slogans he's had is, Sometimes it's better to be a big fish in a little pond. <laughs> but it also demonstrated how humble he was yeah. Yeah. in his yes. approach to things. And you, Yang? Yeah, my name is Yang, <laughs> Yang Wang, you guys know me. And I have been in the field for nine years or 10 years already in the trichomyces. Uh, but before that, I want to say I'm finishing my postdoc and I will be an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. The fortunate thing is I will carry over and I'll keep working on the trichomyces. That's the, that's the field I'm really still mm -hmm. excited about it. And dated back in tw 2009, when I finished my undergrad in China, I just found uh, some excellent papers or knowledge about the trichomyces online. So that's, that's how I approached Merlin. Merlin is now is, uh, is a new assistant professor at uh, Boy State. So I really got the lucky to, to start to the field with Merlin at the time. And now it's uh, 2019 already, so can't believe it's already 10 years. So, but I'm still excited about the field. And uh, I remember the first time I met uh, Bob is the f my first uh, MS meeting is the 2010 at the Lexington, uh, Kentucky. So Bob was just uh, talking with uh, a few giant mycologists in front of the, the hotel we were having the meeting. And I was just so impressed how gentleman, the way he behaves and talks. I was just uh, admired in a, in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this definitely is a, is a great loss. The Bob has passed away, and uh, I was there. I feel the, the better yeah. that. But the good thing is we have a lot more and more people are getting interested in the field, and we we'll well, keep the work going. Yeah. His legacy is alive. The legacy yeah. is and alive, and, and the, that's the presence what's is there. important. I remember when. Like you guys, a few years before you, <laughs> I actually uh, I saw a little post uh, on, on a little letter that Bob had sent to uh, my former advisor that he was looking for students. And 
I was in Argentina at the time doing my finishing my undergrad and I just wrote to Bob and said like oh I'm interested in working with fungi and insects because when I was down there I, I was working in grasses and fungi so <laughs> and now I was interested in working on, on, on insects but they told me oh we're not gonna get funded for that yeah. <laughs> so essentially just his letter came and I contacted him and he was he was very kind and very very ni very excited and he just offered me to come and do my PhD with him in Kansas and I didn't know much about him <laughs> 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 or what trichomycetes were except that they were associated with insects which was what I was interested in so I just jumped on a plane didn't know much what we were doing and I landed in Kansas. Yeah, <laughs> and he didn't jump on one plane. I was on the other end <laughs> waiting for those planes to get there. It was more like the milk run from Argentina. Yes, I recall. it was. Um, and do you recall when, when you got to Kansas or Lawrence, what happened? Oh, well, <laughs> it was, I mean. It was literally a two-day flight or something. It's, yeah, it was yeah. like, let's not even yeah. remember. It was like <laughs> 24 hours later or something. I arrived in, in, finally, the only connecting flight that I could get was something from Dallas to Kansas City, and it arrived at midnight in Kansas <laughs> City, and poor Bob, he drove <laughs> in the middle of the night to go pick me up in Kansas City, and, and I was wow. like, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know. And then on the way on the way back, he was describing, oh, on the landscape, uh, it was dark, <laughs> pitch dark. It was January, so everything was even covered with snow. I know everything dark, and I could see one pine here, one juniper tree <laughs> over there. And he was describing, yeah, well, the the vegetation here is like this, is like that. And I was like, I can't see anything, so I'll take your word for it. So we arrived in Lawrence, and he had put me in a book me a hotel, and he said that he was gonna pick me up the next morning. Yeah. But before that, yes. he asked me if I was hungry, yeah. and it was like two a.m. by that time, <laughs> and I said, "Well, I am hungry." But yeah. and so we sat down and had uh, a, one of these breakfast place that doesn't exist anymore. Yes. And yeah. and and we had uh, breakfast yeah. at he, two AM. He loved he loved to receive people in Lawrence. He and, was yeah. he was he was a great host mm -hmm. and and he was really there for everybody. Yeah, very yeah. much. Yeah. And so that's a nice re recollection. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it was great to have you come and uh, when I was there, I had only been there a few months before you got there, maybe one semester. And it was great to have you come in the mm -hmm. spring and, and start. But uh, and those memories for me are very, very strong with you as a, <laughs> as kind of a brother who, <laughs> who came through this to me. And I'm That's sure you guys have a sense of that uh, kinship as well. Yeah. But it's part of part of this presence. Not only I think it's not just Bob, but through the whole society is that sense of camaraderie and sharing that we bring uh, with these inspired and and engaged um, moments with not only the fungus but the people that, that teach us everything. And I, I'm so strongly um, wedded to that notion of carrying that, that forward. And I always think, pay, look, look back and pay ahead uh, in terms of what we're trying to do. And it's nice to be able to share some of these things with you guys, so I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought about uh, coming here in terms of thinking about Bob and how he loved the meetings and some of the things that you learn over the course of time, uh, sharing time in, in a space, um, are some of the more personal things that I learned also about Bob. Um, but there are certain things that just resonate with me. Um, the, his capacity, in terms of the science, his capacity to share and engage not only scientists of uh, upper echelon, but kids that might be in the periphery of the room, and to go seamlessly from one to the other. And, and have that presence and that re, um, ha, have that genuine capacity to engage and share and convey in a way that is uh, you know appropriate for the level and the, and the sense of what he's trying to achieve even without the idea of trying to achieve anything he did so much by just sharing and oozing that inspiration and that's something that's been in my head as I came the other things are sort of little silly things like 
when I, I have these memories of going to Don Steakhouse in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, and it was the <laughs> biggest <laughs> steaks I've ever seen. And yes. uh, <laughs> for example, receiving Orson Meller and Meredith Blackwell came to, to Lawrence. And it was always a chance to have a chance to go have to, some food, have some 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 sh shared uh, like occasions of storytelling and, and resourcing and everything else. But the other things I remember, Bob going to Don Steakhouse, I'll never forget this, my wife Paula and I were there. And he, he had a white shirt. I don't know why he always <laughs> wore a white shirt to a steakhouse. But it was like, I started seeing red uh, oozing sauce on his shirt. And I said, I don't know if I should tell him or not. Because we had just arrived in Lawrence. But, it was, but I had to say, Bob, you know, it's like. But he said, oh, that's OK. It's just so good. I'm going to keep going. And anyway, but the other thing I remembered about Bob, and you guys may remember this, but he loved ice cream. And it was like, <laughs> any time you had the steakhouse, you had, to, you had to start to remember that you had to leave room for the ice cream, because that would be a next step in the process. Yeah. Anyway, it's a silly thing that I have in my head to well, share. Yeah. One, one thing that I'm sure you guys remember is that he, every time he came to a meeting, he just took extra time to talk to all the students yes. that he yeah. could, yeah. and he was he was very genuine in the fact of uh, paying attention to every person, and he would say hello, and he would tell stories. Yeah, I love his stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he always ta telling stories, and mostly not only the, I mean some of them were scientific stories, but a lot of them were about his childhood and growing up in Rio de Janeiro, where he originally was born and you rem I remember the stories about like cooking in his family and how they <laughs> they yeah. it was important <laughs> that they use the papaya to tenderize the meat <laughs> and <laughs> things like that yeah. and then there was always a lesson about the enzymes that yeah. were in the papaya and these other things just to soften the meat yeah. and I don't know if you had any of those stories, but I'm sure you heard those before. <laughs> well, for myself, I didn't get to spend quite as much time with him, but I did meet him on a few occasions, and he always was very, like you say, very willing to talk to people and very open and give you the attention that you wanted. And he seemed, what I really had more experience with was um, his research, his published papers. And I always was impressed by like the quality of his his writing and the work that he did, for sure. Yeah. Yes, he was uh, he was very productive. I mean, that goes without saying. <coughs> so that's mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, um, I think his research, I mean, speaks by itself. It did, yeah. We don't need to. He truly led by example. Yeah. He was not a strict advisor in the sense of you have to be there, but he would be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. then you would feel like, okay, he's there. I need to be there yes. as well. Uh, yeah. You guys didn't feel <laughs> this, but we were, we were graduate students and the, we knew that if we are going to go there on a Sunday, <laughs> Bob was he there. He will be there. Oh, yeah. He will be okay. there. Yeah. So <laughs> it wasn't like, okay, we need to have a very important excuse not to be in the yes. lab on yeah. a Sunday. And it was mm -hmm. Because it, he it, was there. And so. it was invigorating. And, and the thing about it that you, it's hard to, hard to fathom in some ways is um, I'm only here because of the incredible... Um, Ex extended um, career that Bob had as, as a student who graduated in 53 from Illinois um, out of uh, Leland Shainer's lab and kind of overlapping with Dick Benjamin from that time. Um, Bob had a very, very long career and I will only, I'm only here because of that last grant, the grant from the NSF Pete uh, program, the program to train people in taxonomy. And with understudy groups particularly, and he was the first uh, wave of those grants that came out at that time. And both of us are from that, from benefited from that very much. But the thing that I remember the most about that is like everything that Bob did for me was well past retirement for what would you would put in quotes that, retirement. And yeah. yeah, and that was that energy and drive and that that passion was still true in form, at least as far as I can tell, as it would have been in '53. And then, and I only got there in 1996. Uh, so it's a lo this long history. He uh, retired uh, officially mm. from the university in '94. That was oh. his official retired reti retirement date, and 
he, in '95 he got the Pete Grant, and <laughs> when yeah. was the la when when was the final day that he actually handled the the, the lab? It would have been just a few years before he passed away. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So yeah he had he had space well past so our time there as well. Yeah, I don't know. We're talking about 2000. 16, 17, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. So from 94 to 2017, he was retired. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a remarkable And the retired career. person well, was a, one of the most productive persons in the yeah. department, at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, so that's so impressive. So that's huh? stories about Brazil where he Yeah. Yes. Uh, so well, the, the interesting thing that I remember is a segue to com conversing on his time in Brazil. Um, we were, uh, Jan and Matthias and I were at the memorial service for Bob, and uh, he, there was a pic bit large picture of Bob at the yeah. front of the, f of the room. It was a gathering right. of people in a small, um, small venue, uh, but with a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people that knew Bob in various kinds of ways. But, um, but Brazil was part of the service. So uh, there was a, uh, yeah, can was you a describe it better there for was me? A, yeah. There was a flag, a Brazilian uh -huh. flag, and there were mm -hmm. the, the some arrangement around the picture that was the Brazilian colors, uh, I mean the the Brazilian flag colors, and in fact uh, they play a bossa nova <laughs> during the, <laughs> the, the 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 service. So uh, the connection, uh, his connection with Brazil was very very strong. Very strong. And even though the funny part was that Braz he didn't go back to Brazil for many, many years. Because, I mean, he and Betty went on their honeymoon uh, to Brazil and he spent time in Belen and he he told us the stories about taking the boat from <laughs> Manaus the to banana Belen, boat, the yeah. banana <laughs> boat and, <laughs> and all these, um, these things that uh, he enjoyed doing at that time. But then, once he started his career in the U.S., I think he didn't return to Brazil until many, many years later. We were there. Uh, we were still graduate students, and he got this invitation to go back to Manaus. Exactly. Uh, to because there was a group of researchers in Manaus who wanted to start work looking at trichomycetes in the Amazon, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I remember he went. He had to to go and renew his pa his Brazilian passport because Brazil <laughs> wouldn't recognize, um, I mean, he, the Brazil, Brazil's uh, law recognizes that he was born in Brazil and so he was a, a Brazilian. Mm. And as such, he needed to have the Brazilian passport in order to go back to Brazil. Mm. So, because he tried to apply for a visa and they say, no, you were born in Brazil, you're Brazilian, you need to <laughs> get your Brazilian passport. And he was going on and on how he, he thought that he was not a Brazilian anymore, <laughs> but he was actually always a Carioca, which is the name of the people from, from Rio. And, and then he was actually, I think he was secretly uh, ha very happy that he had to go get his Brazilian passport. He was again. proud of it, yeah. He was proud that he went back and got, and, and then he got it. and. Um, and then uh, he was always telling us the stories about growing up in Rio. Imagine this was 1928, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. 29, 30, and how the family will come to the U.S. once every, I don't know, every six or six, six or seven years by boat. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, by boat. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they wouldn't fly, they would just take yeah. the boat. <laughs> Uh, and and so he his stories about growing up in Rio were very interesting, about playing soccer, about uh, participating in the um, uh, uh, Boy Scouts and in the troops, and uh, he has so many stories. I just uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint. It's hard to, to put anything. D it just pops into your head these things instantly. But just in ter terms of Brazil, uh, he he Bra uh, he would have a lot of these pictures, black and white photographs taken uh, of Brazil and their surroundings, and you knew these were obviously places he had grown up in and meant a lot to him. So his mm -hmm. office was kind of in the backdrop. You could see these spaces filled with those memories. Yeah. Um, Why was he there? 
Yeah, why? Yeah. Why, yeah. Oh, he, yeah. his parents moved to Brazil because his father was was um, he was he was working for the YMCA, mm -hmm. yeah. and so yeah, one he, of the he first was one of the higher up. Um, um, I I don't know what his position was, but he was uh, he. So he took the whole family, right? And the, there were many because Bob had. Many siblings. There were like yeah. seven. Oh, I want to say five to seven. Yeah. Yeah, five to yeah. seven. I don't remember uh, exactly, but he was. Um, he they were there, so he grew up there until he was like twenty one. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember, and then he went to. They they sent him to to study in the U.S. and. Yeah. The, huh. Yeah, the horse story. Yeah, I have to. Oh, yeah, that's the horse, your story. That's a horse. <laughs> the horse story. I have told this story. I have not told this story for a long time, and this could really break the reel on terms of the videotape. So, because <laughs> if I give the prop, if I give the version of the story that's locked in my head in slow motion, it's a very long story because I see all the details of the story which include the rearing of a horse in Norway at the end of a long uh, trip to Norway to do some survey work. Um, and uh, oh my goodness, do I have to tell the horse story? The horse story gives me, f like I'm getting goosebumps thinking of the horse story. Uh, and I haven't told the story for a while, but uh, I will tell the horse story if you would like. Um, so Bob and I, we, I was, a, I, after my PhD, PhD in Kansas, I spent time there as a research associate and uh, we had some NSF support to do a uh, survey of North American and European uh, taxa of fungi to you know ha try to understand maybe how these things are have adapted and um, evolved across uh, Atlantically and look at biogeography and so on. But it was a first chance to get for me to get some collecting outside of North America. It was a really exciting chance to share some time with Bob in the field. And we did two stints. And then on the second visit, we went to northern Norway. We took a long drive at the end of, um, I think it was matched up with one of the meetings in Norway. And we did an extended visit uh, in the upper reaches and uh, elevations in Norway. And um, Bob actually, uh, we arrived and we had a small car that was just literally filled with research gear, just the two of us. And we went up and we went into this uh, facility to uh, get the keys uh, for the research station, which actually was a community center building surrounded by uh, sheep, her uh, sheep farms. And um, literally guests would visit you at the dissecting window and they were little sheep uh, herds, like putting their noses on the window while you were dissecting. But anyway, it was a really, really beautiful, pristine place. I've never witnessed so many waterfalls cascading down from these upper reaches of this beautiful, beautiful place. And, but we were there, and we were arriving at this time in Norway at this research station, which we had arranged in Exa, Norway. And we got to, the, to this facility, which was owned and um, taken care of, they curated by a local person who was one of these, I believe, farmers. And, um, and so Bob went in, and I'm, I'm a horse person kind of out of my, familiarly, I, I'm aware of horses, and I had enough experiences with horses to be, it's one of my, between snakes and uh, spiders and horses, I don't know which one I fear the most, <laughs> but, but I respect horses, and I know what they're capable of. And so after having been bucked off of one when I was really young, I sort of veered away from that kind of my, my family background, and I'm really proud that a lot of people are, but I'm not a good horse person. Sorry, Meredith. But, um, but, we ha but I had this uh, respect for horses. So we arrived, and there was a, a relatively loose-looking fence to get up, you know, to go to the, to the folks that were with the keys and who were going to let us into the building and do our research there. And again, this was like, I don't know, a 13-hour trip, end of a long day, and Bob is, is still energized and excited to get out and go get the keys, and this is the person I've corresponded with, and this is the way I have to do it, so I have to go get the key from him. So he gets out of the car um, and rushes past this relatively meager-looking fence, which I knew was the horse boundary, and uh, continued to go up and, and get the key from said owner, who was speaking something in Norwegian. And um, didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have so much attention to that, but I saw this horse on the side, and I saw Bob going, and I said, okay, this is interesting. Let's, let's see how this goes. And I didn't anticipate anything too dramatic. The horse was massive and white, and it looked like a workhorse. 
and it didn't look happy that this breach had happened. But Bob, Bob went up to get the key, had turned, had spoken to the person and was coming back down and the horse uh, went on two legs mm -hmm. and started walking towards Bob. <laughs> and and I, I'm just outside of this relatively small f like fence sort of thing. And the horse came down, curled its, curled its front legs and drove his legs onto both of Bob's, sh each shoulder. Each shoulder got a knee from the horse. And like literally pushed him into the ground. No one really knows this story. I shouldn't probably be putting this on tape, but anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is where it goes into slow motion. So we, it basically crushed Bob, uh, pushed him into the ground. Um, and I, I literally heur heard this horrifying, horrifying sound of like collapsing body on the ground and a thud and a, and a groan and Bob, Bob's head turning sort of to the side and just laying very still. And then I saw the, the horse, um, horse's owner come down, come running down, yelling things, grabbing a huge, a huge stick off of this wood, wood pile, like a four foot <laughs> stick, and like hitting the horse to make sure it would go away. And, and Bob is just, I, I just thought, oh my God, the, this is the end of it. Like Bob, this is, there will be nothing beyond this. How do I get Bob home? And like it was, hor it was a horrible feeling. And um, Bob was laying on the ground motionless and it was for several, it felt like several minutes, but it was probably more than like less than a minute. And anyway, I, w I rushed over after I saw the owner take care of the horse. And, um, and again, there was no communicate. We had no communication that was really clear because it was Norwegian and English and, and just trying to see what would happen. But, but the concern was all um, there. And anyway, we, we got, uh, I went over to Bob and I said, how are you doing? Are, are you okay, Bob? Is your, are, and I heard, I heard him like he was breathing and I heard him moaning some more. And then he, he I think he was so, sort of semi-conscious but came back and he immediately got up and was concerned about, uh, his main concern was, um, uh, what happened and um, help me up and you know and I and he said um, uh, I think he was his main concern was is there like um, where are my glasses and um, and I looked at his face and he had a massive scratch like scratches all over his face so it was on gravel so he had a massive massive scra scrapes on his face glasses were broken um, and a huge cut over his eye and and he said, um, I, you know, there's some blood here, How, is everything okay? And I said, well, it looks okay, but you, <laughs> may, but you may need some stitches, you know? I think you may, have, may need some stitches. But I said, Bob, we can go home tomorrow. We don't need to do this. And he said, oh my goodness, no, no, this, this is fine. But his arm was really, really hurt. Uh, his, his head no mo he, so it detached, to, it, it, it uh, uh, tore a lot of the ligaments in his arm. He, he, we, we went back down the, the mountain. So some of the neighbors, uh, the neighbors of the folks that we got the key from, um, actually one of them was the local doctor. So we went down and met her at the, the, the local clinic. Uh, they, they sewed him up, they cleaned out the dirt, um, sewed him up, gave him antibiotics in, in the wound and, um, and uh, put a sling on his shoulder. And I said, and I, got, I, said, I got back to the, we, we went back up the hill again. And they, they, all of these folks were really good and they all helped us get down and back. And, uh, and, I, and I sat there thinking about that, that night. Um, it was a very quiet time in this research station where we were sitting. And I said, Bob, you know, there's no reason why we need to do this. We've had one trip to Norway and we've got some great data and there's no reason why you have to, you know, there's, you're, you're hurt and you're, you know, we, we should really make sure you're okay. And I said, in all my heart, Bob, we could go tomorrow and, and take care of this. And he said, there's no way we're going home. We came here to do the job, <laughs> do the project. And, and by golly, it was, a, it was an amazing thing to witness. I cleaned the wound every night, gave him, like stretched his arm as much as I could uh, during that trip. He did one-handed uh, aquatic sweeping in the, in the <laughs> streams, one-handed kick sampling, picking things out of the tray with one hand. And when we did the sections, he would pick his arm up and it would like hit, it would hit <laughs> the counter with a thud and we did the sections. Wow. And again, this is like post-retirement, didn't need to be in the field, but it was an amazing excursion and um, and I think uh, I, that's the horse story. But the, the, main, theory, the main part of it is uh, we almost lost him there. And it was, a, I don't know how, it, uh, how he survived that. Uh, it would have been in the early 2000s, probably that trip, uh, yes. just a year. Yeah.
it, it was in the early 2000s, and uh, I mean, I was still in, still in Kansas, and I, I remember I picked you. I, I remember that when I saw Bob, he was wearing the sling still, and then they had to operate on him, and it was... Yes, there was a lot of post... Uh, uh, yes. It the, went the, on for several months, yeah, really. It, w yeah. it was like a, a long recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, he was mm -hmm. in his 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was in, in, in his earlier 80s, I think. Well, he, he told the story. I yeah. heard it in the same. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah so. well, yeah, it was an amazing, it was an amazing thing to witness. And, you know, um, it, it, he was just so strong and passionate and energized and uh, just never a quitter and uh, mm. yeah. always wanting to, to we do We did it. a yeah. lot of field trips and he was <laughs> always, he was the one who were, was pushing, yeah. not us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we not were the young ones, and we were like, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And we would just go back collecting all day, and then we reach the lab maybe 4, 5 o'clock or 6, and the sections goes until midnight or until whoever falls asleep first. <laughs> yes. And that's the way it was, and yeah. Bob was there all the way. Yeah, it was well, great. Oh, oh, there's vast regions of yes. the globe. Yeah. There are a lot of regions. We're just beginning. We, yeah. We're just beginning. I mean, even though if you look at his contributions, he has done an, a great job all over the place. He had, Bob did um, a lot of Central America. He did co Costa Rica, Panama. A uh, little information that we have from Brazil was him. He did Argentina. Um, what else am I missing? In Costa, Costa Rica, uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, mm. uh, Japan in the early days. Yeah, Japan, Japan, Japan yeah. Australia, mm -hmm. Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He spent. He had some very memorable experiences Canada. with Indo <laughs> and China. And the uh, can. You can miss that. The the there's a gene. The, uh, the, 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 one of his favorites was Australia. Yeah. Australia. Ostrosmidium boomerangus. Boomerangus. One he used to like to talk about. Yeah. yeah, that's the one he was. He, he, he was. You guys switch it back. Well, we may, have to deal, <laughs> we may have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always taxonomic things to deal with. Yes, the, 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 uh, the boomerang may, I may come back to haunt us. But <laughs> he, yeah. His passion for collecting around the world and, and filling in these gaps um, was, was, was amazing. And, uh, and uh, he actually just pushed us to, to go do these different things. I never thought that for my for my thesis I was collecting in places that I was never even thinking about. And uh, he said, "Oh well, if you're gonna do this project, you need to go see uh, <laughs> such and such in this part of the country, and then also you have to take the opportunity to go get samples in France." And <laughs> and it yes. was it was it was really amazing that he supported us to. Um, to do all the all this research, it didn't matter, and he pushed us to to do it. Yeah, I I remember um, when when I first arrived here, the first thing, well, our f I first my first MSA meeting was in Puerto Rico. You remember that one? Uh, that yeah. It was ni ninety eight, and we arrived in Puerto Rico, and we were gonna stay. Uh, uh, another 10 days sampling, collecting. That's right, yeah. Oh. Uh, we, we never went on a field trip. Uh, we never went to an MSA meeting without tagging in and building a field trip extended with yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Pasalagitos getting loose in the hotel room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that well. Was, I was going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, when we were in the meeting, during the meeting, the meeting was in a hotel similar to this one, but there was the beach there. Mm -hmm. And so. In, in in my room, I was sharing the room with Bob at the, uh, uh, in that particular meeting, and I set it up, the, the microscope was set up in the room because I found some of the f the legia, uh, the rock lies, yeah. the, the rock lies around the, the beach. And he said, oh, you should collect those because they have <laughs> usually this species of Acelaria and, and I just dissected it, and that those were my first marine collections <laughs> <laughs> ever yeah. in the hotel during the meeting. So that was that was funny. And then, then when we were we were going around the island, different different reasons, and um, 
it, and it was uh, that we brought, <laughs> I still laugh about it. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't say this. <laughs> but we brought back like these live beetles, the uh, Pasolid beetles, because we wanted to do experiments in the lab and have them in the lab. And uh, those days were like, the, the controls were lax mm -hmm. compared to what they are now. So we actually managed to get those beetles. But uh, speaking of the story about the beetles that got loose, that was in LSU. That yeah. was when we went for the Deep Haifa meeting at Baton Rouge. And we went collecting. We collected a bunch of beetles, and we kept them in bags, in <laughs> Ziploc bags. They were alive. <laughs> and we were like in the room, and when we went to go to bed, it turns out that they can eat through that. They can eat oh. through plastic. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. were crawling all over the bed. <laughs> and we were like jumping around. It's like, what is oh. this? <laughs> yes, luckily they stayed within the room. It was, it was amazing. that And Bob was like, oh, come down, let's collect them. Yeah. <laughs> in a yeah. better place, in a better container. So okay. There was... There were some great stories like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I, you know, I, the, the, the amazing thing is there's so much more that we can do, but not the beetles, and there's, there's so many other organisms that have these fungi that we haven't found them in yet. So it's, it's exciting to think about those kinds of stories. But then a lot of those things transform into, well, you can collect it there, but there's also this stuff in the Bridenthal Forest. So then, um, you know, Bridenthal uh, Ecological Reserve is, an ex is a University of Kansas um, reserve that ha is, has basolid beetles in it. It's one of the most Western extensions of that population. But I then, you know, post basolid beetle uh, excitement hit me, and I did a lot of collecting. You did too in, in the Bridenthal um, location once we got back and we became aware of some of these things. But it, there's some really memorable things with basolid beetles and so much more to do, and Meredith's lab has done a lot of work with those kinds yes. of things as well. I think the other part that's just throwing things into my, I'm going to just get it off my head so I don't keep thinking about it, reflecting on some of the things you mentioned earlier. I was very fortunate to, um, well, not fortunate, but I had the chance to help clean out Bob's office at the University of Kansas after um, his family had a chance to go in there, and I was very fortunate to go in and help clean up the last of it, and, and was a, um, I had permission to take anything that, that I felt was be valuable. And in, and in an amazing fashion, I saw some of the things that meant the most to Bob at the end of his career because he had a smaller room and an office as a retired professor. But he maintained a presence there right up until the last uh, year of his time uh, with us. And, but what I was able to secure in there were some, some of his notebooks. He was famous for carrying a calendar, a, a mini calendar. It was always the same. And, and I'll, these are things I'll always remember. But in his back pocket, with a, yeah, with a <laughs> string on the day. But I, look, uh, have, I have the good fortune, I, I've collected in a Brazil, I think it's a Brazilian cigar box, the stacks of these calendars. Oh, he kept yes, them. Yes, they kept them all. So I have a record of these calendars that he used to hold from the 50s on. And so there was a, it's, I have this amazing thing, and I haven't looked through them all entirely, but one of the things I wanted to share with all of you is that uh, in these notebooks where he would put some of these precious comments, I, I leafed through a few um, this in the last month or so over the summer. I've been kind of looking through some of the stuff I got from his office. Um, and one of the things I noticed are things that are important to him in, are in there. And I happened to flip on one day to one page, and it was Rob Bourne. It was like very small, Rob Bourne, and the weight. Uh, and Rob is, Rob is his son, right? Rob so is in, his in, in his notebook is Rob Bourne. Yes, uh, no, well, second. Oh, second. But uh, he has two ch children, uh, Rob Ru and uh, Ruth. Ruth. And, uh, and so I, I thought that was a remarkable thing to have in your notebook. But then at the tail end of all of these, <laughs> I mean, it was really, it meant a lot, so he has it in there. But uh, on the tail end of this notebook is also, he would put notes when he was at meetings, and significant things were in there. NSF, NSF grants, numbers were in the back of the notebook, so he has them all there, quick access. And then he would take notes on anyone, so he was so good at this, um, you know, pre-digital era, mm -hmm. because he would keep a list of the people he met at the meeting in this notebook, and he would quickly uh -huh. note, yeah, so these are things, the little secrets are hidden in there. 
But, there, but that's the attention to detail that he gave to the process that I, I admire so much because it, you know, you could easily not do that kind of mm. thing and kind of whimsically you know about your business, but he took everything in a, in a, in an engaged way, and I, I just thought that would be a worthwhile share that popped into my that's head when we were talking about that's that. That's yeah. that's it's true. But he would have, he would have, uh, everything was in there, uh, like departmental meeting, blah blah blah. So anything that was like significant to the day, but then bigger things would be listed separately at the back. Yeah. Also, he also pay attention to details and. If you if you grab the notebooks of his research, the yeah. research notebooks, and you guys have seen some of them, then those, yeah. you guys have seen the those mm -hmm. things. Yeah, I I was always impressed by the email reply by Bob. Yeah. Like oh. ask some several simple questions, mm -hmm. but he can reply very detailed email that that I can just digest yeah. for weeks and see that's <laughs> a lot of information that's so precious. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm still reading back. I just archive all of that. Mm -hmm. It's the 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 amount of details that he pay attention to a lot of details, and then he will just write down all the information he had yes. yeah. on yeah. that particular topic, and it was there. Yeah. And also, one one of the things that make Bob, I, I guess, make him, <laughs> uh, the way he was, and also so terrible, it was that he was always available, at least to us. Mm -hmm. As as his students, he will drop anything that he was doing, no matter what, just to pay attention. Even if we just knock on the door, just to say, "I I don't know what to do with this," yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> something. And he will drop whatever he was doing, and just he would always come over. Yeah, come over and just pay attention to us. Countless and, times, you would you would say, "Bob, I have something on the slide." And I'm just not sure what it is. I, the first thing, uh, it's very humbling when you first start, you know, this field is so different. And um, I had a similar feeling of, but that you had, Matthias, of being interested in arthropods and being interested in fungi and not being sure how to marry the two things, except this, this chance to go to Kansas and do so. Uh, that was so graciously offered to me as well. And I, I had a letter similar to yours, and I hesitated to no end because I, I really couldn't believe that it was for real, that there was, this was an offer, that it was just being nice. So it took me a while to, to own that opportunity, and, um, and I'm so grateful that I did. But the other thing um, uh, that I had in mind when you were just talking about this, uh, and now it slipped because I, I just changed the topic in my mid-sentence. So what was the thing that you just mentioned, Matthias? Uh, just get the, me back to space. He would drop, he would drop oh, yeah. anything. Yeah, to so, so the, very first, the very first thing that I, I took him over to show, that I'll never forget this. My very first picture of any trichomycete, my very first shot of something I thought was a zygospore. I thought, oh, I got lucky in the first try. You guys know the story. But it's a picture of a diatom. And I like <laughs> to share it with you. I like to share it with you because it reminds me, like, you don't worry. We all start somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, um, but that, but he was nice about it. He said, "Well, yes, yeah, so those are in there, and uh, but that's okay. You'll get used to it." Yeah. So, so I think that's great. And if uh, if you want, um, it was great to have a chance to do share these stories, and uh, I'd be happy to well, engage more. But thanks for the opportunity, and and yeah. thanks for sharing some of these special moments.